Thank you. I'm not sure quite how I follow uh, the uses and abuses of teledildonics and Internet of Things, but I'll show you uses and abuses of CT scanners. And uh, a little bit of work we've been doing. Take a mic in your head. Sorry? Take a mic in your head. Yeah, probably easier. Uh, show you some of the stuff we've actually been doing to uh, recover some lost film and just some lost cultural heritage. So uh, the first question that comes up generally, do people know the difference between a CT scanner and an MRI machine? Well, they're both big things you lay down in. They both make a noise. Uh, CT bombards you with ionizing radiation and uh, MRI makes your protons vibrate. Um, I build and abuse CT scanners. I, I want to build a small desktop MRI, but I haven't got around to it yet. Um, so this is a medical CT, uh, used for horses. I couldn't get permission. It, it's really difficult to get uh, ethics approval to show your patient going in a CT, but no one seems to care too much about horses. Uh, so the big donut shape is actually a rotating x-ray source with a detector opposite it. Um, the sort of CT scanners I use are more research systems. So desktop lab scale systems, uh, where the scanning volume is not a horse's head, it's approximately a Pringles can. So if it fits in a Pringles can, it can go in my CT scanner. And um, a Pringles can in this particular scanner would take around about a week to scan. It's not a, it's not a fast scanner, but it goes for ultimate contrast. Um, you, you can see things that you just won't see in commercial systems. This was built specifically for some dental research. So all the stuff I'm showing, the abuses of the CT scanners, no patients were stopped from getting their surgery or their treatment due to what I've been doing with CT. This is all research machinery. So I said we use ionizing radiation. Uh, where, where am I operating? I'm operating up in the X-ray region of the spectrum. So past the visible spectrum, through the ultraviolet, into the X-rays. Uh, generally, round about 90 kV X-ray um, energy, um, which is not actually a scale shown on that spectrum, but um, closer to the UV end of the X-ray spectrum. So hard enough X-rays to go through bone. Um, so just taking a step back from CT, what do you do if you've just invented X-rays? So you're like these people, you've connected a high voltage X-ray source, which is the, the black tube in the background, to uh, a vacuum uh, source, a vacuum bulb, uh, which is some of the things that are on the back shelf in the picture. And the guy is actually looking at his hand uh, through a phosphorescent screen. The, the two of them are both imaging their hands. So if you've just invented x-rays, you look at your hands. If you're the guy that actually invented x-rays or first discovered them, Wilhelm Röntgen, what you say is, Berta, darling, uh, please put your hand in this dangerous looking apparatus for me while I, I go outside the room. Um, and you get the very first um, x-ray image, medical x-ray image taken of Berta Röntgen's hand showing the bones and showing her gold wedding ring. She is recorded as saying, I have seen my death, because she's seen how she's going to end up as a skeleton. Uh, she didn't die from hand cancer or anything. She, she lived to a fairly ripe old age for uh, the 1860s. Um, but x-rays are boring. You know, if you've ever had an x-ray, you've, you've generally had an x-ray because you've done something like this, compound fracture of the arm. Uh, you, you're having a bad day if you're having an x-ray. But I don't do x-rays, I do CT scans. And if you're having a CT scan, a medical CT scan, CT scans are terrifying. Um, because you're having a CT scan if you've had a really bad day. You've gone through a car windscreen at speed or you're diagnosed with a tumor in this particular case. This is a simulated image. Um, so you really only have CT when there's something seriously wrong but I don't do medical CT, so just to reiterate, there's no patients were harmed in the, uh, the messing around I've been doing. So what do I do? An actual day job, the use of CT scanners. I, I scan lots of teeth, I work in a dental school. So I scan lots of extracted human teeth that are gonna be used for research projects, 
Or when the boss comes in and says, my seven-year-old daughter's just lost one of her teeth, she wants to see what it looks like inside, that goes in the scanner, and you wonder why seven-year-olds have teeth that look like this and have that many fillings, and I'm not going to comment. <laughs> um, I also scanned lots of bones. This was actually an extracted femoral head from one of our technicians. Uh, she had to have her hip replaced. Uh, she's getting quite elderly and she was getting hip pain. What we actually see are these protrusions coming up at the surface. These were scraping the inside of her, um, her hip joint and causing pain. This is the reason the hip was replaced. So this is a human femoral head which we scanned in our scanner. It took about three days to scan. And we are able to, these protrusions are force colored, but they're actually much harder than the bone. There's more mineral density, so with our scanner with the extra contrast, we can see this. That you probably wouldn't really see in a commercial CT or um, medical CT. Other bones I sometimes scan are in much worse shape. This is a collapsed, I think it's third and fourth lower vertebra, or it might be second and third. Uh, that have actually collapsed in this poor guy and fused. Um, it didn't have a happy ending for him because I've got a section of his lower spine in my lab. So um, you know, we, we got this after been donated to medical research. But that's all sort of the day job. That's what I get paid for doing, scanning teeth and bones. Borderline from the use to the abuse is more looking at things like this. So this is actually an acorn um, that's got parasitic wasps living inside it. These were used in the Middle Ages, well, from early antiquity to the Middle Ages. You grind these up, uh, mix them with iron sulfate, and you can make a really nice dark black ink, uh, which is a permanent ink. And the history of the world is written in the ink made from this. It's called iron gall ink. And you can actually see in this so this is, this is rendered CT data, uh, volumetric rendered CT data. And you can see that there's chambers in there and the wasps are growing in it and this was obviously harvested before they hatched out. We did discover something with this. The literature we were reading says there's only ever one wasp per acorn. In this one we count at least six. We went and found some entomologists told them they went, oh yeah, the literature's wrong, everyone knows that. But uh, <laughs> no one's got around to correcting it. Um, so this led on to, well, if we can actually see the, the oak apple scan or the, iron, uh, the oak gall scan occurred um, after this particular piece of work, because someone said, well, if you can see very low levels of contrast in bone or teeth, can you actually see the iron in iron gall ink on paper or on parchment? And it turns out we can. We, we did some initial test scans and we, we could see and we could read rolled up documents. So then the Norfolk Record Office got in contact with us and said, well, we've got this 14th century parchment roll. Uh, it's the uh, report on the manner of Bressingham. It's basically the yearly accounts. Um, this is as far as it will unroll. It's got wet at some point in its history. It's written on parchment. Parchment is processed animal skin. When it gets wet and gets compressed, it basically turns into a rawhide dog chew. Um, if you've ever tried to unpeel a rawhide dog chew, you know, it doesn't work. Uh, you can see there's tear holes in this where someone's tried to peel it apart and it's just ripped. So we scanned this. Um, it took, uh, I think this took about five days to scan. And what we were able to do is produce a full virtual unrolling of this. Um, if you look on YouTube, uh, search for the Apocalypto project, uh, you might want to put minus Mel Gibson in that to just get out. We, we named the project before he named the film. Um, you'll find uh, an uploaded uh, section that the BBC did on the work we did this, and there's some links to some other information. But what we were able to show is that the top section is invisible light, the lower section is just from the X-ray data, and we're able to see ink and contrast in places where it's even faded optically. So this was pretty good. Um, we published this, and then we got contacted by these people. And these people have a really cool project. They've got this chest of uh, 2,600 undelivered 17th century letters, of which approximately 600 have never been opened. Uh, have a look at the Brienne project. This is ongoing. If you're in the Netherlands, uh, 
in The Hague, go to the uh, Postal Museum or Mu Museum of uh, Communication, you can see this chest, you can see the work we're doing with this. What they wanted to do was read, well, what the, the historians that are interested in this project, they want to know what the unopened letters say. They can read the ones that are open, but what, what's in the, the ones that have not been opened? Um, so we got involved, and they have these wonderful wax seals, so they don't want to open the ones that are not yet opened for many reasons that they go on to on the Brienne Project website. But effectively, you can't study a locked 17th century letter if you've opened it, it's no longer a locked letter. Um, and they have all these wonderful seals, and they form their own security. It would actually be a, a really good EMF camp workshop, somebody to uh, do the letter locking uh, for that. I'll suggest it for next time. Um, so we scan some of the letters, we stack them up. This is a, a sort of Swiss roll section, so the letters are projecting out of the, the board towards you. This is a, a section through, a slice through, roughly halfway. You can see these are pretty complicated. There's many layers, there's lots of bright spots. The bright spots in this are actually crushed uh, seashell that's been used to absorb some of the ink, to dry the ink on the page. Um, the ink shows up as much fainter bright spots. But if you remember those lovely 17th century wax seals, they're full of lead. You don't get many x-rays through the lead and the reconstruction algorithm we use just cannot cope until so you get all these white areas and streaking and failure. Uh, working with a couple of really bright um, students at MIT at the moment to uh, try to do the unfolding of these and uh, do digital origami to virtually unfold these letters, make them readable, uh, we're hoping to publish this year. Um, so after we'd done all of this, people were um, keen to see what else we could do. And we got sent this photo. And it, it looks like cine film. Um, and it came along with an email that said, effectively this, it's triacetate film, it degrades, it releases acetic acid. This is, triacetate film is basically polymerized vi vinegar. It, it turns back into vinegar. Uh, the problem is it's also autocatalytic. So when the vinegar is formed or the acetic acid is formed, it forms more, it helps degrade faster, it forms more of uh, the acetic acid, helps, do the, helps uh, degrade faster. The emulsion that's pasted on, the actual part of the film that contains the image, then becomes cracked, distorted, it slides off of the acetate base, um, it's no longer usable. Uh, and then the layers of film, as this progresses further, the layers of the film actually get stuck together, so that if you actually try to unroll this, the way it was described to us was if you take a sheet of glass, draw an image of a stick figure in Marmite or ketchup, put another sheet of glass on the top, it'll be recognisable, but as soon as you try to peel those apart, the image just smears. Um, so what usually happens in archives is as soon as there's the first hint of vinegar about a film, it immediately gets put through a, a capture system to get what they can from it. A recording's made, the original goes in the bin. Uh, they don't want this because if there's acetic acid fumes in the archive, it can infect other film, it can, just, it can cause real problems. So, and usually there's more than one copy of a, a particular film. So we, we did a proof of concept. We kept pulling the guy off because one, this is bigger than a Pringles can. This won't fit in my scanner. Um, so we, we, and we also didn't think it was gonna work. But the guy from the BBC, Charles Norton, kept on and he sent us this. Uh, for the younger people in the audience that don't recognize what this is, it's sort of the prototype micro SD card of its day. <laughs> Thank you. So this is actually a 16 millimeter positive negative, uh, sorry, positive print uh, of some film, the Gamot British News with a soundtrack. It fits in a 35 mil film can, which fits in my scanner quite nicely. We put it in the scanner, left it for a weekend, and expected to come back in Monday just to nothing. We reconstructed the image, and just paging through in some very simple software, you can see 
Actually, we've got pretty good separation of the layers of the film in the Swiss roll slice. And if you just cut it at any particular angle through, ah, there's some pictures in this. We might actually have to do this. We were really expecting to come back to an empty data set where nothing's really visible. And it turns out we do have the contrast sensitivity to see um, silver, deposited silver on triacetate stock. Um, so this caused a bit of a problem because we didn't expect to have to do this. Uh, we didn't expect it would work. So we ended up spending, the plan was to spend maybe an afternoon. This will be a quick hack. We'll see if we can get anything out of this. At the end of a quick afternoon, it was like, ah, this, this does actually work. Um, we'll, we'll spend another day on it. Uh, so the guy I work with, Graham Davis, who is an uh, absolute genius, he spent most of the time on this. He did the film. I was working on the soundtrack. Um, he spent a week on this. It was always like, I just need another afternoon. I can just tweak this. I can just tweak this. And we ended up with this. So we came in on a Monday. The sound's not playing. Ah. So there is actually a soundtrack for that. Uh, it didn't play. Let me just, that might be my fault. I, have I muted it? No, I've just got no way of getting sound out of this at the moment. Uh, it basically plays the soundtrack. And the soundtrack was the bit I worked on on this. The soundtrack in Cinefilm is just recorded as uh, amplitude modulation wavy line along the side. Ah. Okay, let's try this with sound. I've heard this so many times, but I like this. Let's go back. This is the Germont British News, presenting the world to the world. So it's a bit crackly, but the sample rate is limited by the resolution we scanned at. Um, yeah, it's a real physical limit. We, we scan this at about a 30 micron voxel resolution, which limits the playback audio bandwidth to about 7 kilohertz. Um, so after we'd done this and we actually received this, we sent this to Charles and he was like, will you please have a go with our film? And he told us a bit more about what it was. Um, it's this. It's Morecambe and Wise Series 1, Episode 2. Uh, it was found in a shed in Nigeria. It's print from Telecine. The film can, it was actually on the bottom of the stack. So the film can has got cracked. It's basically means the film inside has been exposed to the elements for six, 50, 60 years. Um, and it's in a pretty degraded state. Um, what used to happen is the BBC uh, took a load of stuff on videotape, um, but videotape's expensive. They wanted to reuse that. It's the reason there's a lot of missing Doctor Who and a lot of lost Morecambe and Wise and a lot of early TV shows. The stuff that survived was the stuff that got teleprint or telecined and sent out to South Africa, New Zealand, uh, Australia, on the understanding they would you know, burn after showing. But this one survived. Um, it's too big to fit in my scanner. It does not fit um, in a Pringles can. It does fit in a laser cutter. Uh, it turned out, if you really want to scan this at the resolution we think we need, you need to cut it into roughly one-inch cubes. <laughs> you, could, you can't put this through a projector. It's, it's already... It would never go through a projector. So they said, what the hell? Got nothing to lose. Um, so we did the first scan. Again, it took roughly a weekend of a one-inch cube. We were paging through... The, the scan data, and we saw this image appear, so roughly the middle of that. To people of a certain age, and I count myself in that, you immediately recognize Eric Morecambe. The, the face kind of stands out, especially when you're, you're at the monitor, we're looking at it, and work is almost the size of that, and we're sitting up close to it. You, you recognize Eric Morecambe. So it was like, oh, this does actually work. Um, the software that had been written to play the Gamut British News didn't work for this because that was relied on a continual spiral it could trace. This is a one-inch cube with lots of disjoined edges. So Graham worked on it. Uh, he got some pretty good software working. And then uh, 
the BBC got involved. So this guy, Adam, at BBC R&D, whose day job is to do all the really cool, fun stuff, um, took what Graham and myself had worked on and wrote some other software. So he did a lot of statistical methods to just try to identify what the acetate layer is because it merged. You get um, bridging layers of, of the goo of the, the actual film layer bridges the acetate. He did a lot of stats on this um, and was able to even you know, account for the warping because these are warped layers and start extracting full frames. Um, and the software was written, I think this is MATLAB. Um, but it, would, it gave a lot of options, load in the data, look at the actual layers which are shown on the left-hand side, and then attempt to process this as close to automatic as possible. The software we wrote at Queen Mary was, was very manual. This, this was aimed to be automatic. And it produces some really nice images. It takes about three to six minutes per layer. Uh, so each block, each one inch cube is roughly six to nine hours. Um, but you don't get complete detection near the edges. Well, part of that is when you laser cut the film, you're not necessarily cutting on an image boundary. You, we, we generally get one and a half to two images in a block. Um, and those are not always complete images. So the good thing is nothing much changes between frames. So if you get half of the top of a good image and the bottom of another one, you, you can merge them. And so uh, Adam worked very hard on this. Um, and some of this was actually published on the BBC R&D blog uh, around Christmas time this year. So my phone started going mad. Uh, lots of people, I've just seen this on Twitter. This is what you've been working on, isn't it? Uh, at Christmas. Um, so... To give some idea, we ended up, we, we scanned uh, about 35 blocks, so 35 sections. The film's degrading the whole time. Each one takes a weekend to scan. We do have some other commitments for things we needed to scan, so we, we couldn't be always scanning film. Um, so we ended up, we did a complete circuit of the outside of the reel into one inch cubes, and then we just cut a radial section straight through and scanned those, because as you're getting closer to the center of the reel, the layers are getting closer together, the, the time periods, not, uh, not such a large time period between layers. Um, and we, we produced this sort of thing. And then Adam had to take it to the next level. Oh, the other thing is an audio recording of this episode existed. It was the only thing that they knew existed. Um, some guy in Australia made a, a reel-to-reel -reel tape recording of this from the TV. Um, so this is what we have so far miming to Bing Crosby's voice and beautifully as well not a word out of sync no I'm not miming now it's Mingles <laughs> you realize of course that the tape has stopped yeah, yeah well, well of course it's stopped he's he's started start. again you, how does he do it it's, it's a thrill working with a small little genius <laughs> it's me who's talking now I'm not talking like Bing there we uh, unfortunately fade out um, so this is still very much work in progress. We're hoping to get this cleaned up and hopefully get the whole, the whole thing will be on the TV, uh, hopefully for one Christmas, because it's Morecambe and Wise. It's not Christmas without Morecambe and Wise. Um, that is sort of some of the abuse of CT scanners. Th th this is where we've got to. So we're, we're getting there for actually producing a whole TV episode from stuff that we didn't think would ever work. It had no reason to ever work, but you know, our kit is better than we think. Um, one other thing, just a quick aside, total abuse of CT scanners. This is my lab. I sit at that desk, you know, a sizable portion of the day, near a CT scanner, processing CT results. Well, if you've got this and you can scan what you like, of course you do. One day I had an apple for lunch. Uh, there was a hole in it. Now, I didn't realize that until I was about to take a bite out of it. Well, you put it in the CT scanner. Well, put it, just use it as a, a radiography machine. Just use it to take an x-ray. Am I going to see the maggot? Um, no. I, I put it in. There was no maggot in my apple. So I posted this up to Twitter. Hashtag x-ray my lunch. And I put a couple others in. This was another one. Going back to my East End roots. Any guesses? Jelly deals. Mm. 
But of course, the day you don't CT the apple you take in for lunch and you take a bite out of it, this is what happens. Uh, just one other very quick thing, because this, this is what we did for one of our students at work. Um, any guesses what this is? Yeah, it's an iPhone 3, iPhone 4. Um, but the iPhone was running when we put it in there, so what we wondered was, well, what, what does the camera of an iPhone see as it goes past the X-ray emitter? Uh, first thing is, it screws up the backlighting and stuff. You see all these white dots, they're not compression artifacts, they're X-ray photons hitting the detector. Um, I'm surprised it lasted as long as it did. Um, we, we've actually been now trying, this phone's been donated to us, we're trying to kill it in the scanner and it just isn't dead yet. <laughs> Uh, just one other thing, a friend of mine, we, uh, George Smart, we bought uh, some pound shop USB hubs and they didn't work. And then we took the back off uh, and if you actually look at the pins for these USB ports, they're all in parallel. That doesn't work. What's under the black blob then? Nothing. <laughs> There's bond out pads. They obviously Someone must have sat down and done this as a practice, you know, for how to lay out a PCB. And there's, a, okay, well, solder some bits on the cell it. Um, so, yeah, that's it. That's the end of my talk for now, but uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, David. I think uh, the plan was that David would... Uh, take questions uh, in the bar or somewhere yeah, like I'll, that. I'll be around the bar. Uh, so we won't do questions here, but uh, thank you all very much for listening. <laughs>